How many of you have heard of Adolf Rupp? Adolf Rupp, a handful. Adolf Rupp became the head men's basketball coach at the University of Kentucky in 1930 at the age of 28. Can you imagine being the head basketball coach at a major university at the age of 28? Because the University of Kentucky had this mandatory retirement thing at age 70, he was forced to retire in March of 1972, winning 876 games. Can you imagine that? In 41 seasons, far more than any other coach at the time. Rupp's Wildcats had six Final Four appearances in the NCAA tournament, winning the national championship four times, as well as winning 27 Southeastern Conference regular season titles. Coach Rupp was the National Coach of the Year four times and was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in April of 1969. He was so famous, so respected in the state of Kentucky that when a new basketball facility was opened in 1976 in downtown Lexington, it was named after him. Rupp Arena seats 23,500 people is the largest indoor facility specifically designed for basketball in America. But, since most of you don't know who Adolph Rupp is, you probably don't know that he began his coaching career right here in Marshalltown, Iowa. Because the high school boys already had a basketball coach in 1926, Adolph Rupp agreed to coach the high school wrestling team instead. The problem is he knew absolutely nothing about wrestling. So he read a book about the sport and led the Marshalltown High School boys to their last state wrestling championship in 1926 before going on to another high school and then coaching at Kentucky. And folks, now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> When told of Rupp's death in December of 1977, Larry Steele, a former player, said, and I quote, he was an unbelievable coach. Everyone around the country knew what kind of a coach he was, but in Kentucky, he was a true legend. Marv Harshman uh, from the University of Washington coach at the time said that Adolph Rupp was, quote, a legend before his death. He was a giant in his time. How could anyone replace a basketball legend in Kentucky like Coach Adolph Rupp. Well, Joe B. Hall was hired for that unenviable task, and he enjoyed 13 successful seasons as the head basketball coach at the University of Kentucky. I share that with you because in our Bible reading this last week, Moses is described with these words. There has never, that's what it says, there has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all Israel. How would you like to follow a legend like Moses as the leader of all Israel? Our text for today outlines how God expected Joshua to succeed Moses. It's helpful advice for anyone having to follow a legend, but more importantly, it is a proven formula for how legends are made. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to begin reading from Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you, from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you. Or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. 
Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instructions continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, maybe no one here will ever have to follow a legend, whether it be Adolf Rupp or, or Moses at your place of employment or as a coach or in any other capacity. But I'm telling you, every one of us here this morning, and I do mean every one of us, can leave a lasting spiritual legacy that will last for many generations if we follow God's guidelines as given to Joshua. So if you take out the outline there inside of your bulletin, the first thing that God told Joshua in verses 1 through 5 is, is this, remember whom you serve. After Moses' death, God spoke audibly to Joshua from heaven. We're not told, I should say, whether he did so audibly from heaven and, and, and like he did to John the Immerser when John baptized uh, Jesus or whether he spoke audibly as he did to Peter, James, and John when Jesus was transformed before them on the mountain. Maybe, maybe God appeared as an angel and spoke directly to Joshua as he did later on in chapter 5 of our book or as he did to uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 and 18. Maybe God spoke to Joshua in a dream as he did when he told Joseph to take Mary as his wife. How God spoke to Joshua is not nearly as important as what God said to Joshua. And we are told in verse 5, God says to, to Joshua, I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. Now if you turn just a page or two there to chapter 6 and verse 27, we read, the Lord was with Joshua, and his reputation spread throughout the whole land. Why? Why does his reputation spread throughout the whole land? Because Joshua had deliberately decided to make Jehovah the God of his life. Joshua chose to do what God told him to do. Not because Joshua wanted to be famous, not for his own personal self-glorification, but for the glory of God. After the Israelites had conquered Canaan, before they left to occupy their land and build their homes and their houses, Joshua addressed the people of Israel in words that we will look at in a little more detail next week. But Joshua said to them, there are many so-called gods the people of this world worship. And you all need to make a personal decision as to who you will worship. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua's personal decision, his personal example, impacted not only his family, but it impacted the entire nation of Israel. Now, if we are going to serve the Lord, then we, like Joshua, must choose to personally follow the Lord. No one can force us. No one can make that decision for us. When the Israelites turned to worship the pagan god Baal, God summoned the prophet Elijah to confront his people. And Elijah did, and he stood before the nation, and he shouted to them, How long? How long are you going to waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. Elijah was simply trying to say, Make a choice. Quit wavering here between following God when it's convenient and following Baal when you don't think God is looking. And what do you suppose the people of Israel decided? Did they choose to follow God? Did they choose to follow the pagan god Baal? The Bible shockingly reveals their decision with these words. The people were completely silent. Choose who you will worship. And out of the thousands of people, no one said a thing. No one spoke up and said, 
I'm going to serve the Lord. Not one. Nada. Jesus would later reveal silence is in fact a choice. If you're not with me, you are against me. If you haven't consciously chosen me, then you have subconsciously chosen against me. Because we all serve someone or something. So the question is really, whom will we serve? Or what will we serve? Joshua chose to serve the Lord. What about you? But, but serving the Lord is really an ongoing series of choices as well. When Esther was elevated to the status of queen in a foreign land, she found herself with this serious choice of, of whether to reveal her Jewish heritage and try to spare her people, but in doing so, possibly losing her own life or remaining silent and saying nothing and living while her people died. Well, Esther had determined some time ago that she belonged to the Lord. Esther had determined that she would do what the Lord wanted her to do. So Esther used her position as queen to approach the king and ask him to spare her people's lives. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told to bow down and worship this pagan statue of gold that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. And they were threatened that if they did not bow down and worship this statue, they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. And they responded to the king Nebuchadnezzar by saying, listen, the God whom we serve, the God whom we serve is able to rescue us and save us from your power, O majesty. But even if he doesn't choose to, we will not serve you. We will not bow down to worship your gods or your statue. Whether we work in an office or we work on the factory floor, whether we are single, whether we are married, whether we are the coach of a team or a player on a team, whether we are in a position of leadership or in a position of fellowship, don't ever, ever forget who we serve. The New Testament says we are God's masterpiece. And God has recreated us in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that bring Him praise and not ourselves. Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, make sure you do it all for the glory of God. Work hard and cheerfully at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Don't forget that whatever you say, whatever you do, you are a representative. You are an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. And consequently, Jesus said no one can serve two masters at the same time. We're always going to serve one more than we serve the other. We're always going to devote more time, more energy, more resources, more finances to one God over another. So who are we serving? If we're serving ourselves, it will be obvious that by the decisions that we make, we're advancing our own agenda. We're advancing our own wants and needs and desires. Or if we are bent on pleasing others, it will be difficult to speak out when we disagree with people because we're afraid of what they might think of us. It will be difficult to tell people no when we don't agree with them because we're more concerned about receiving the approval of people than we are receiving the approval of God. In case you hadn't noticed it, serving the Lord will put us at odds with the world. Serving the Lord will get us in trouble with the world. And yet the psalmist wrote, Though a mighty army surround me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. Why? Because my eyes are focused on a world we can only see by faith in the promises of God's Word. 
We have to deliberately choose to serve God and give Him glory wherever He places us, whatever role God puts us in. Celeste Sibley was a columnist for the Atlanta Constitution newspaper several years ago when she took her three children uh, for a morning breakfast to a diner. But since it was cr so crowded, the, the kids and mom weren't all able to sit by each other in the same seats. They were kind of spread out there along the counter. Young eight-year-old Mary was at the end of the counter. When Mary's food was served, she called down to her mom, farther down to the counter, and in a loud voice she said, Mom, don't people say grace in this place? <laughs> Silence came over the crowd. Before Celeste, the mother could figure out how she would respond, the man behind the counter said, Why, yes we do, young lady. Would you say it for us? And all the people at the counter bowed their heads. As eight-year-old Mary Sibley prayed, God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. My question is this. If an eight-year-old will live out loud for the Lord, why can't we? Always, always remember who we serve. Always. Regardless of what the world says or does, we serve the Lord. Second thing that God tells Joshua here is, he, he, in verse 6, he clearly defines the task that he's giving to Joshua. Some of the greatest difficulties in relationships are a direct result of unexpressed or even unreasonable expectations. I mean, Many marital problems result when a husband has expectations of his wife or a wife has expectations of her husband that, that the other is not aware of or unable to fulfill. I mean, the same is true at work sometimes or in our friendships and relationships. When starting a job, it's important that we exactly define what the boss expects us to do. When starting a relationship, it's a good idea to define what the expectations are from each person involved in that relationship. And so God comes to Joshua, and in verse 6, he says, Joshua, you. No, you, Joshua, you are the one who will lead these people. But some people estimate numbered over 2 million. You will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Now, I know you've heard this before because I just said it last week. God always empowers us to do what God calls us and tells us to do. Always. And the opposite is also true. God isn't going to call us to do something that He hasn't empowered or gifted us to do. And I say that because we need to know here, Joshua wasn't supposed to be like Moses. How do you follow a legend like Moses? Moses was a patient individual. The Bible tells us, and, and you read it, to where he, he would stand there and listen to the people's disputes between each other all day. Joshua didn't have that kind of patience. On the other hand, Moses was not a military leader, but Joshua was. And so... God is clearly defining Joshua's task. It's your responsibility to take the people, lead them into the promised land. Jesus knew what his task was, what his purpose and reason for coming to earth. I came to seek and to save the lost, he said. Gabriel told Matthew that Mary would have a son. You are to name him Jesus. Why? Because that name Jesus means he will save his people from their sins. So there was no question in Jesus' mind why he was here. He knew why he was here. He knew how, why he had come. I think that probably for the most part of his life, Jesus knew he had an appointment with the cross. That was always before him. But Jesus also came to show mankind how God wants us to live. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to live. And the right way is God's way to live. 700 plus years before Jesus' birth, Isaiah said to, to the Messiah would have the name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. And so Jesus came and Jesus said, I have come. 
that you might have life, that you might enjoy life to the full. I have set for you an example that you should serve others as I have served you, that you should live as I have lived, that you should do for others as I have done for you. Therefore, learn from me. Look at my life. Imitate my life, Jesus said. Did Jesus heal people? Well, of course Jesus healed people, but God did not send Jesus primarily here to be a medical doctor. Did Jesus teach people? Well, yes, he taught a lot of people, but God did not send Jesus here primarily to be a professor. Did Jesus perform many miracles? Well, of course he did. But Jesus' healings and Jesus' teachings and, and Jesus' miracles were all for the purpose of bringing people to salvation because he came to seek and to save the lost and then showing us how to live. In the movie classic, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, Dorothy has a dream. Now, she doesn't know it's a dream. And for the first 10 years that I saw the movie, I didn't know it was a dream. It took me that long to figure it out, you know. She's having a dream. She, she really thinks her house falls on the Wicked Witch of the East in a land far away from Kansas. And then the Good Witch of the North tells Dorothy that if she wants to return to Kansas, that she must travel along what? The yellow brick road, yes, and find her way and make her way to the Emerald City where she will find the Wizard of Oz. He will be able to help her get home to Kansas. So she embarks upon her journey along the yellow brick road, and as she goes along, she encounters the scarecrow and a tin man and, and this cowardly lion, and together the four of them decide that what they need they can find when they get to the Emerald City. And they, they meet the Wizard of Oz. Now, isn't it amazing the spiritual connotations and illustrations that are, are evident here? And so all four believe that the wizard can solve their troubles and they go together on this trip and along the way they encounter many obstacles but, but they're committed and they're not going to let those obstacles keep them from their common goal which was finding the Wizard of Oz because he could help them, each of them, with their needs. Now, as we go through life, we have a lot of titles, a lot of roles, a lot of responsibilities, a lot of people that God puts us in contact with. For sure, all of us, because we're here, all of us are children of someone. Many of us are parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles. Many of us are employees. Some here are employers. Some here are coaches, and others are members of those teams. Most of us are members of some kind of an organization or a club or a church. Some are even presidents or officers within those organizations. But regardless of what we do, regardless of where we work, and regardless of where we live, regardless of what responsibilities or titles that we may wear in life, Christ's followers are to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We are to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. If we are a Christ follower, then serving Christ means leveraging our roles and leveraging our contacts to tell the people that He puts us in contact with the wonderful news of God's love and God's grace. That's why we're here. And then God says to Moses in, or I'm sorry, Joshua in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 1, closely follow orders after God clearly defines Joshua's task, he then gives Joshua instructions on how to fulfill that task. And the one thing we read over and over again, if you've been reading along through Deuteronomy, and the one thing we see again here now picking up in, in the first part of Joshua is obedience to God's Word. Verse 7, be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not, I repeat, do not deviate from them turning either to the right or to the left. And if you do not deviate from these instructions, you will be successful in everything you do. The people of this world often think that prosperity and success come from having power, having influence with people of, of influence, having a relentless desire to get ahead, just keep pushing forward. But the strategy that God taught Joshua for success is contrary to the world's strategy for success. Three times God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. Why? 
Why did he tell him that three times? Because leading people can sometimes be lonely. Because not everyone in this world is guided by godly principles. Because life isn't always easy. And God knew that. So God reassured Joshua and brothers and sisters, he's reassuring you and I today as well. Whenever you come up against trials, whatever those obstacles and trials might be, whoever is dragging you down, be strong and courageous. Like Carrie and Lori saying, I, I don't want to be the one who chooses to walk away. When I obey despite my feelings, despite my fears, God does amazing things. So where does strength and courage come from? Does it come within? Was it, is it a, a chromosome that we are born with? No, strength and courage come from trusting in the promises of God. And how do we find out? How do we know the promises of God? By continually studying them, by meditating on them, God says, day and night, by obeying them, putting them into practice. What does continually studying the Word of God mean? What does that mean? Well, it means that we start by reading it on a regular basis, which is what we're doing this year. And even if you didn't start with us in the beginning in January, start with us right now. I mean, come on, would you feel safe if you were going to have brain surgery or heart surgery and you found out the surgeon isn't someone who, who keeps up and reads the latest research and what's going on in his or her field? Well, of course not then why do we think that we can be successful Christians leaving a lasting spiritual legacy and not be reading God's Word on a continual basis? What's up with that? Why do we think that? Moses hammered this truth over and over and over again throughout the book of Deuteronomy. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them. Why? Because we don't always get things the first time. Repeat them again and again to your children Talk about them when you are at home. Talk about them when you're on a vacation. Talk about them when you go to bed at night. Talk about them when you get up in the morning. I absolutely, unequivocally guarantee you, your life will change the more you read and study God's playbook we call the Bible. I guarantee it. What does it mean to meditate on God's Word? Why the psalmist tells us a well-adjusted, content, balanced, and influential individual is someone who thinks day and night, someone who thinks day and night about God's law. And that individual who does that, the psalmist says, is like a tree planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit every season without fail. You know, a tree planted along a riverbank, it doesn't have to worry about drying up and dying, does it? Because its root system taps into that water that rarely ever dries up. When King Edward VI, the, the King of England in the 1500s, attended a worship service, it is said that he would stand while the Word of God was being read and he would take notes. And then when he went, uh, when he, later he would study his notes. He would read those scriptures again and he would apply them to his life. Meditation is little more than taking the time to apply God's truths to our daily thoughts and our daily words and our daily actions. If all we're doing is just learning some neat little uh, facts. It's not going to do us a world of good. We've got to apply the facts that we learn to the way that we live. How does this scripture impact my life? That's what meditation is. And then finally, God tells Joshua to obey everything. Not some things, not most things. Obey everything Moses had commanded God's people. Dr. B.J. Miller once observed, and, and I put this quote in your, on your insert there, it is a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do, no matter how hard it is, than to face the responsibilities or the consequences of not doing it. At a banquet honoring the American officers responsible for the surrender of Lord Cornwallis to the colonies in the American Revolutionary War, a distinguished French officer asked George Washington's mother how she was able to raise such a splendid son. Her answer wasn't long, wasn't complex. It was an answer we probably need to hear more of today. She said, very simply, I taught him to obey. It 
So there it is. Right there in these few verses there in Joshua chapter 1. Whether we're following a legend at home, at work, at school, on the team, in an organization, God's instructions to Joshua for following Moses are just as applicable for us today as they were for Joshua. But most of us aren't following a legend like that. So more importantly, God's instructions can be used by any godly person who wants to leave a lasting legacy for generations to come. If you and I want to have an impact on people, including our family and others, then what we need to do is contained right here in Joshua chapter 1. Know whom you serve, clearly define your task, and, and closely follow your orders. Folks, it's not a yellow brick road that Christ's followers have to follow. And our Savior, why, He's way more than a wizard. Some years ago, the United Press International reported that termites had eaten through a large stack of pamphlets in the mailing room of the University of California at Berkeley. Okay, can you picture that with me? Large stack of pamphlets, however big they were, and termites had eaten through those. What made the discovery by some maintenance men so amusing was the title of the pamphlets the termites had eaten through. The title on those pamphlets was this, Control of Termites. <laughs> well, one would think that at such a distinguished center of higher education that the college buildings would be free of termites since so much was known uh, by those at that college about termites. But it is one thing to have information in a pamphlet about termites, and it is quite another to make a practical application of that information. Which is why Jesus, when speaking to his disciples, said regarding the things that he had taught them, Jesus said, happy are those who obey God's laws and teach others to do the same. Happy are those who obey God's laws and then teach others to do the same. I'm not a perfect individual. There isn't a, one of us here this morning who is. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ, I am a forgiven individual. And I am determined to use whatever time the Lord gives me here on planet Earth, however long that might be, to do and to be what He wants me to be. What He wants me to do. And I know that if I, like Joshua, am going to do anything significant for the Lord, I've got to be bold. I've got to be courageous. I've got to be diligent. And I've got to be obedient to these never-changing, always applicable, and amazingly practical, eternal truths of God. Listen, they work.